Okay. So if you are joining us online, your text begins on page 66. This is book 21 of the Odyssey, the test of the bow. In books 18 through 20, Odysseus observes the suitors and finds that two in particular, Antinous and Eurymachus, are rude and demanding. Penelope asks Odysseus the beggar for news of her husband. He says he has heard that Odysseus is on his way home. Penelope, however, has given up hope for Odysseus' return. She proposes an archery contest to the suitors, with marriage to her as the prize. She enters the storeroom and takes down the heavy bow that Odysseus left behind. Now the queen reached the storeroom door and halted. Here was an oaken seal cut long ago and sanded clean and bedded true. Four square the door jams and the shining doors were set by the careful builder. Penelope untied the strap around the curving handle, pushed her hook into the slit, aimed at the bolts inside and shot them back. Then came a rasping sound as those bright doors the key had sprung gave way. A bellow like a bull's vaunt in a meadow, followed by her light footfall entering over the plank floor. Herb-scented robes lay there in chest, but the lady's milk-white arms went up to lift the bow down from a peg in its own polished bow case. Now, Penelope sank down, holding the weapon on her knees, and drew her husband's great bow out and sobbed and bit her lip and let the salt tears flow. Then back she went to face the crowded hall, tremendous bow in hand, and on her shoulder hung the quiver spiked with coughing death. Behind her maids bore a basket full of axe heads, bronze and iron implements for the master's game. Thus in her beauty she approached the suitors and a near pillar of the solid roof. She paused, her shining bell across her cheeks, her maids on either hand and still, then spoke to the banqueters. So before I tell you what she says, here is a picture of her um, going into the room where Odysseus kept his bow. Obviously, the door to that room hadn't been opened in a while. Um, so it creaks open. She sees the bow and pulls it down, and she begins to sob. Because to her, she's thinking, he's never going to come home to use this bow again. Some other man is about to use this bow, and whoever does best with it, I'm going to have to marry that person. Um, so she has a lot going through her mind right here. So she goes in and faces the suitors and says, My lords, hear me. Suitors indeed, you commandeered this house to feast and drink in day and night, my husband being long gone, long out of mind. You found no justification for yourselves, none except your lust to marry me. Stand up then. We now declare a contest for that prize. So the prize to marry her. Here is my lord Odysseus hunting bow. Bend and string it if you can. Who sends an arrow through iron axe held sockets, twelve in line? I join my life with his and leave this place my home, my rich and beautiful bridal house, forever to be remembered, though I dream it only. So despite heating and greasing the bow, the lesser suitors prove unable to string it. The most able suitors, Antinous and Eurymachus, hold off. While the suitors are busy with the bow, Odysseus, still disguised as an old beggar, goes to enlist the aid of two of his trusted servants, Eumaeus the swinnard and Philoetius the coward. So one that keeps the swine or pigs, the other that keeps the cows. Two men had meanwhile left the hall, swinnard and coward in companionship, one downcast as the other. But Odysseus followed them outdoors outside the court and coming up said gently, You herdsmen and you too, swinnard, I could say a thing to you, or should I keep it dark? No, no, speak, my heart tells me. Would you be men enough to stand by Odysseus if he came back? Suppose he dropped out of a clear sky as I did. Suppose some god should bring him. Would you bear arms for him or for the suitors? The coward said, Ah, let the master come. Father Zeus, grant our old wish. Some courier guide him back. Then judge what stuff is in me and how I manage arms. Likewise, Eumaeus fell to praying all heaven for his return, so that Odysseus, sure at least of these, told them, I am at home, for I am he. I bore adversities, but in the twentieth year I am ashore in my own land. I find the two of you alone among my people, longed for my coming. Prayers I never heard except your own that I might come again. So now what is in store for you, I'll tell you. 
If Zeus brings down the suitors, so brothers with my son, here, let me show you something else, a sign that I am he, that you can trust me. Look, this old scar from the tusk wound that I got boar hunting on Parnassus. Shifting his rags, he bared the long gash. Both men looked and knew and threw their arms around the old soldier, weeping, kissing his head and shoulders. He as well took each man's head and hands to kiss, then said, to cut it short, else they might weep till dark. Break off no more of this. Anyone at the door could see and tell them, drift back in, but separately at intervals after me. Now listen to your orders. When the time comes, those gentlemen to a man will be dead against giving me bow or quiver. Defy them. Eumaeus, bring the bow and put it in my hands there at the door. Tell the women to lock their own door tight. Tell them if someone hears the shock of arms or groans of men in hall or court, not one must show her face, but keep still at her weaving. Philoetius, run to the outer gate and lock it. Throw the crossbar and lash it. Odysseus the beggar asked the suitors if he might try the bow. Worried that the old man may show them up, they refuse, but Penelope urges them to let Odysseus try. At Telemachus' request, Penelope leaves the men to settle the question of the bow among themselves. Two trusted servants lock the doors of the room, and Telemachus orders the bow be given to Odysseus. And Odysseus took his time, turning the bow, tapping it every inch for borings that termites might have made while the master of the weapon was abroad. These suitors were now watching him, and some jested among themselves. A bow lover, dealer in old bows. Maybe he has one like it at home, or has an itch to make one for himself. See how he handles it, the sly old buzzard? And one disdainful suitor added this. May his fortune grow an inch for every inch he bends it. But the man skilled in all ways of contending, satisfied by the great bow's look and heft, like a musician, like a harper, when with quiet hand upon his instrument, he draws between his thumb and forefinger. A sweet new string upon a peg, so effortlessly Odysseus in one motion strung the bow, then slid his right hand down the cord and plucked it, so the taut gut vibrating hummed and sang a swallow's note. In the hushed hall it smote the suitors, and all their faces changed. Then Zeus thundered overhead one loud crack for a sign, and Odysseus laughed within him that the son of crooked-minded Cronus had flung that omen down. He picked one ready arrow from his table, where it lay bare. The rest were waiting still in the quiver for the young men's turn to come. He knocked it, let it rest across the hand grip, and drew the string and grooved butt of the arrow, aiming from where he sat upon the stool. Now flashed, now flashed, arrow from twanging bow, clean as a whistle, through every socket ring, and grazed not one, to thud with heavy brazen head beyond. Then quietly Odysseus said, Telemachus, the stranger you welcomed in your hall has not disgraced you. I did not miss, neither did I take all day stringing the bow. My hand and eye are sound, not so contemptible as the young men say. The hour has come to cook their lordship's mutton, supper by daylight. Other amusements later with song and harping that adorn a feast. He dropped his eyes and nodded, and the prince Telemachus, true son of King Odysseus, belted his sword on, clapped his hand to his spear, and with a clink and glitter of king of keen bronze, stood by his chair in the forefront near his father.